Hi, this is Jonathan Schwartz, and what an evening for me. I have an old friend here tonight who's going to sing for all of us with her friend, Wally Harper. They travel together all over the world, making moving, serious music with a twinkle in its eye occasionally, as you will see and as you will hear. Barbara Cook and, and Wally Harper. I met Barbara when I was about 15 or 16. We sang at some party together. Uh, some opening. It must have been 1960 or 1961. I've never forgotten it. Her singing was so electrifying then. You can imagine what it's become if you haven't heard her for a while, and I don't think that's possible. She's given a couple of concerts at Carnegie Hall, and there are three Columbia albums out, and as I say, with Wally Harper, she travels the world. So please join us for an evening of celebration, an evening with Barbara Cook. Stay tuned. Wally, play a little for us. Well, my goodness, how many musical comedies have you seen through the years? Musical plays, plays with music, presentations of music. Well, I've been to a lot, and it seems that Barbara Cook has been in all of them. I was, I was once talking about, about you, Barbara, on the radio, and jokingly, I suggested that you're the only woman who appeared simultaneously in two Broadway musicals. And the start of each musical was staggered, so you could appear at the Schubert and then go down to the Majestic. Listen, and there are people who believed that, who talked to me about it. Well, know. it was entirely possible. <clears throat> you could just race down, so you had someone to accompany you down the street. <laughs> and as I say, the shows were written to accommodate this phenomenon. There'd be a scene at the Schubert in which you would appear, then you would race down to the Majestic and appear in that scene, because you were so entirely ubiquitous at the time. Do you imagine these things very often? <laughs> I do. That's the problem. <laughs> I found in but dealing people with people. people believe you, Jonathan. I can't tell you how many people have asked me if that was true. I had to call you a is liar, that, a total bald-faced liar. Well, how could anyone believe anything as preposterous as that? Well, but, they do. But, Barbara, the point of the matter was that there was a period of time, and you're going to do a song first later tonight called The Ingenue, in which you were simply the ingenue. I guess the most spectacular was the music man. Mara I never thought of myself as uh, the ingenue. What did you think of yourself of, as? I think just a fascinating, wonderful person. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were thinking correctly. No, I, I just didn't... I still don't think those... Some of the roles were uh, soubrette roles. Mm -hmm. A lot of people won't know what that means. Mm -hmm. They were... Well, tell us what it a, means. Well, I think it's a term from operetta, mm -hmm. meaning uh, the, the soubrette role was a sort of a, a comic, usually a secondary role, rather than the ingenue, which had the, the young lead, leading Well, for role, example, the, a, the gay life, uh, you were the, the woman who pined after the man, who yes. loved someone else. Yes. She you, was so feisty, though. I think of an ingenue as being the typical, simpering little... Oh, I don't at all. I think Who's of the ingenue what? as being a, a gorgeous dame who gets the guy. And occasionally... You do? Yeah, oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, hell, I'll be an ingenue then. Oh, be an ingenue. You've convinced I, me. <laughs> I, I can't wait for, for, for you to sing that song. And I, did you remember the, the wonderful song from 1961, I've been waiting oh. for the magic moment? Mm, beautiful song. Uh, I, I would imagine, when people think of you, many people go back to the music man and Marilyn the Librarian. Did you know something? Did you know that Ray Bolger was as much as signed? He was the first For choice. For the music man? Absolutely. Did you know that? I knew that, he'd, that he was certainly strongly considered. I didn't know that. Oh, that no. Had gotten they had involved. decided on him. I didn't know that. And then his camp came in and uh, they demanded something uh, fairly uh, uh, ungivable. If I remember correctly, somebody did say that he wanted all sorts of changes made that they were not willing to make in the script or something. Well, I'm I, not sure about I, that. It's my understanding he, he, he wanted to have in the second act 20 minutes alone on the stage because he had mm. come out of the success of Once in Love with Amy and Where's uh, Charlie. Well, maybe that was the, the change that he was talking about. It's a rather substantial change. To say the least. Yes. But indeed. as a result, they went with an unknown actor. Robert Preston. Well. He was fairly unknown at that time, and uh, obviously he was absolutely wonderful. How many performances of The Music Man did you give? Oh, I don't know. I was with it from, let's see, we opened in December of 1957, and I left in July of 1959. So mm. I, I have no idea how many that is. It's a lot. When did you meet Wally? 
When did we meet, Ball? We met a couple of, I think maybe when you, I think the first time I really was introduced to you is when we were doing any Wednesday. I think, I think that's when you know, somebody said hello and we that shook That was what, 1965, 75, 65. Well, I, one I of those you, decades. I ask you both because uh, every now and then there, there is attracted to each other two people who think exactly alike musically and spiritually and uh, they become inseparable and uh, very dependent on each other because because their thinking is so dramatically similar wouldn't you say that well uh, I, the times when i've tried to do the act without wall have been very difficult even though i've done it with some superb musicians it's just that what we do is so it's like it's like uh, conversation between us. And, exactly. And no two people can have the same conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to do it without him. Talk. Talk. You say something now. I've never done it without you. <laughs> oh, you never have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you ought to try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wally, what were you up to when you met Barbara? Well, I was doing mostly theater. I was doing Broadway shows and writing <clears throat> and some conducting. And uh, dance. I did a lot of dance music. I was doing a lot of that. Oh, but of course you were aware of Barbara. Oh, she, certainly. You'd heard her sing. Certainly. I loved her work. She sings the way you play. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank can, you. Can you think of uh, uh, other people, uh, another, another professional couple, uh, who are related to each other as spiritually as the two of you? Jonathan and Darlene Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, obviously, for those people who Love don't it. know, that, that's Joe Stafford and Paul Weston, uh, yes. who have assumed uh, uh, comedic characters, and in, 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 in Joe Stafford sings slightly off-key, and Paul Weston plays in a ridiculous, fancy way, and they've made four or five albums. But you know something quite <coughs> seriously, Wally? Uh, removing Jonathan and Darlene Edwards from what they do, I would think, perhaps, that the real Paul Weston and the real Joe Stafford might fit into this category of being so compatible through the 40s and 50s in concert and on records. That might uh, be true. His arrangements for her, Haunted Heart and Come Rain or Come Shine and mm -hmm. Embraceable You, mm -hmm. or all of those beautiful records through the years, the Vincent Newman song, it sounds as if it's one person in orchestra and in voice. And even though you don't have an orchestra, we have but John Beale on, on, uh, on guitar to help us out. Uh, it, it still sounds like one voice, and it sounds like uh, a Paul Weston orchestra and, uh, and Joe Stafford uh, with them. It's just uh, extraordinary. Now, do you, do you travel the world, Wally? The we world. We travel, travel a lot. Well, the world like, Tokyo. This year. Have you ever been to Tokyo? <laughs> yes, but As not a to work. Of fact, we, we were have, there, but we not were to just work. There. We were there. Well, what in heaven's name were you doing? <laughs> Having fun. Mr. To you said, I think we'll go to Tokyo? Well, we had been in Hawaii working. We yeah. had been working. So we'll oh, I this far, let's, you know. Oh, so I we see. went to Hong Kong and Peking and Tokyo for fun. And uh -huh. It was a lot of fun. And Kyoto. Yeah. Oh, so we stayed in one of those uh, hiragiyas, aren't they called mm -hmm. hiragiya? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the typical, I don't mean typical, I mean traditional Japanese inns with the wooden tubs and you sleep on the floor and all that. It was wild. I hate that. <laughs> it was wild. I think I'd love it if it was at the beginning of the trip, but it was at the end of the trip. No, and I don't want it at all. We just come back from China, and I was so filled up with China, and I was very, very tired when we yeah. got to Kyoto. So it was a little odd trying to figure out how to live on the floor. Mm -hmm. It was it was interesting. Mm -hmm. It was definitely interesting. <laughs> you know, Wally, in, a, in in the 1961 show, The Gay Life, mm -hmm. there was an enormously complicated dance routine and song that was written, uh, oh, maybe seven hours before opening night. But uh, uh, the whole chorus, everybody leaping about, and a tough song to sing called The Label on the Bottle. Do you know this I song? remember it very well. Yeah. Barbara learned it in those six hours. Well, and, almost. 11 hours. He's exaggerating. Yes, by five <laughs> hours, Barbara. <laughs> so let's say 11 hours. It doesn't defeat my point. <laughs> and on opening night, you performed it as if you'd been doing it uh, for, you know, weeks and months. But it was just one of those things that happened. Well, you know, you get into the swing of doing things quickly when you're on tour with a show like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're on the road, when you're working it out. Because they're, you put, you're, you're so sharp. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just you're so keyed up and so sharp and so ready that it's it's easier than it sounds well that show almost became a barbara cook concert because the leading man walter chiari who was billed as the italian danny Kay, 
Couldn't say. Only the first part was right. He was Italian. <laughs> but he was about as Danny Kayish as Roy Cohn. <laughs> and they kept taking songs away from him. And, uh, and, but he was a sweet and man. Sweet man dear, back in Italy where he now man. is, being the Italian Danny Kay. Dear sweet man. Sweetest thing who ever lived. Brought that show to its knees. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't help it very much. <laughs> he didn't help it, let's face it. It's true, but, but he it was became, dear to work with. Uh, he be, uh, it, the show became a Barbara Cook concert, and uh, the piece de resistance was the label on the bottle. With that, that went, went ta 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 ta. There was a can can. I guess it was. Ta 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 ta. I tell you, I have. I, it was fun. It was, it was wonderful to watch, and particularly with the knowledge you had learned it in a minute and a half. But I, I will ask you, Wally, uh, to step over to the piano and, and let, let's start our, our music part of the program with one of the most invigorating of all the numbers you do and one of the songs that's as famous in the world as anything ever written. Okay. This is just a wonderful song. Okay, start. and I'm going to stand up, get off this bloody stool. Great, now I'll, I'll sit here for this song. Okay. Great. Terrific. All right, I'll move us back a little bit for now. How's that? Terrific, Bob. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Wonderful. Okay. Where are we Hit playing it, honey. To? Brown. Why? You know I don't lie. Not much. It's been said she knocks on bed when she lands in town.
Sweet George Brown. <laughs> Bravo! Bravo! Stay with us, we'll be right back. Wally. <laughs> Now, Barbara, this first song in this section of our program this evening is one of my favorite songs that you perform. It is not a, a world-famous song in the way that all the things you are is, or long ago and far away, or, or take me out to the ball game. <laughs> but it's a very moving, poignant song that I think touches upon something that I mentioned a little while ago, and that is your simpatico with Wally. It seems that you're performing it as one person. It is simply called You and I. Well, who, now we have to do it perfectly, uh, Mr. Harper. Who brought it to your attention? A friend of ours, Jonathan Hadari, mm -hmm. who is now playing Harvey Fierstein's role mm -hmm. in uh, Torch Song Trilogy. Mm -hmm. It has the Barbara Cook, Wally Harper, or the, the Wally Cook, Barbara Harper <laughs> quality. Which, uh, which so touches me, and I'm proud to have you perform it on my program. Barbara Cook and Wally Harper. Leslie Bricketts wrote this song. Oh, 
this next song was written by the lady who wrote the score for the best little whorehouse in Texas. I'm talking about the, the New York version. I'm not talking about Dolly Parton's movie. I'm talking about the real thing, written by Carol Hall.
Mr. Harper wrote this song with a friend of ours, David Zippel. For quite some time I've heard that I'm alleged to be an ingenue. And yes, it's true, when I was two, I pledged to be an ingenue. My agent said before I went to do what Doris Day would do and sign upon the dotted line if William Morris Pay would do. said to me the state would be my medium but ingenues must pay their dues with unrelenting tedium we must be sweet or quite discreet and dress in unappealing clothes we may not tease our friends or hair or swear or wear revealing clothes, wear revealing clothes. one has to fear the casting couch producers lust and greed and like they let you like convince you like their hairlines all recede alike they scream a lot and scheme a lot and even David Merrick will be calm at first but in a burst get totally hysterical and ingenue must promise to imprison her virginity all men above the age of ten are kept from her vicinity a lady's reputation is unlikely to improve at all a stain on that no longer matter cleaner can remove at all require you to ham a lot and you're inclined to wind up in a bus and truck of camelot the parts for boys you play against they bring out all the clones to do and movie roles you live to play they give to shirley jones to do so many shows the actress knows the critics will attack her in it's so hard to live on guard and stay as sweet as saccharin and of all the pros and cons you'll end up with a minor score and that is why It's always um, wonderful to work with people who are really talented, but sometimes those people are also extraordinary human beings, really, really good people. Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach are two of those people, and I'm happy to say we're still friends after, God, 20 years since we did this show together. I'd like to do a few songs from their show, She Loves Me.
like me when we meet will the shy and quiet girl he's going to see be the girl that he's imagined
To too. say the least. You know, Jerome, Jerome Kern uh, made a comment about comedy songs years ago. Uh, songs that, in effect, favored the lyric. Not necessarily the ice cream song, but, but others in shows. Kern said that for a composer writing for such a lyric, that composer ought to, to write a melody that is as beautiful or as interesting as possible, but not obtrusive. Now, Jerry Bach, of course, succeeded with a song you did not sing, a little song called The Candy Box. Oh, it's wonderful. That's a beautiful song. melody. Yes, but also yes. the melody in Fiorello that he wrote for Pat Stanley to sing called I Love a Cop. Oh, I love that. I, I, love, I love a Fiorello cop. too. I love a cop. <clears throat> and it's a wonderful melody that accommodates a comedy lyric, but without getting in its way. I think, I think Kern was right. And Walla, you played it splendidly that <laughs> night. As always. And John friend. turns out to be not only obviously a guitarist, but an accomplished bassist. John Beale, I thank you. And Wally and Barbara, and we'll all be back in just a minute. So stay right there. We'll be right back. Wally? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
sing of jewels or of ice cream that's vanilla. And if I really have to, I can sing it a cappella. lingers on. Song, uh, Tennessee Williams has Blanche DuBois singing that in the bathtub. <laughs> uh, uh, really? I don't remember that. We're at, the, at the end of Streetcar. Uh. Now listen, we've got some final notes planned for you, so stay where you are. We'll be right back. Yeah, just at the end of at Streetcar. She's, she's singing. I remember that. Yeah. Barbara, your singing, of course, uh, is always powerful and, and warm and touching, and it was tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you Thank very you, much. Wally. I enjoyed it. Why don't you play for us a little? Sure. Wally Harper. 